Hi, I'm Ricky Quintana, the founder of Hunard's Fair Trade, and I talked one of my good buddies, Nancy Dunnitz, into joining me for a chat. It's not an interview, it's a chat. Uh, this afternoon, Nancy and I first met, gosh, almost four years ago, I think, uh, at the Las Vegas trade show. And that was before I was a Fair Trade Federation member, but I got my program and I looked in the list and found all the fair trade vendors and I made the rounds. And the, the video of you is, is frozen. That's okay. Don't worry about it. It will, it'll, it'll buffer and it'll be fine. This is one of the joys of doing a Zoom chat. Okay. And everybody is used to it, so no problem. But I met Nancy at that first trade show, and we had a wonderful little chat. What caught my eye was her embroidered jewelry. And since I was working with artisans in an entirely different part of the world, but they, they're, um, one of their arts is embroidery. My eyes perked up, my ears perked up, and we had a wonderful little chat. And then since then, we've done some shows together and uh, played together and have gotten to be great friends. So Nancy was one of the, was the very first person I wanted to uh, chat with about being a fair trade uh, company and what's involved in that. And since this is just a chat, Nancy didn't have to provide me with the fancy bio and the history. Uh, so I will just let you, Nancy, um, tell me a little bit about how you ended up in fair trade. You've been at it much longer than I have, but uh, you have a very interesting story to go with it. My phone is ringing, but I don't know how to make it stop, so. <laughs> It'll stop, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay, it stopped. Okay, I'm ready for you now. What was your question? <laughs> Just tell me a little bit about how you ended up in fair trade. What well, for, for the most part, I think it's sort of a happy accident. Um, Unlike many of the people that our colleagues in Fair Trade Federation who have jumped in, you know, wanting to change the world, when I first started my business many years ago, um, I was a naive young girl person, and I had been working in corporate America, and I wasn't very happy, and I just got very naively said I wanted to design pretty things and travel to faraway places and sell things to people. It was a very naive uh, coming from a very naive place. And um, I was working here in the entertainment business in Los Angeles, and I had some vacation time, and I thought, I don't know anything about this potential business I want to hop into, so why don't I go to a country that's close instead of a country that's far away? So I thought, let me go to Guatemala. It's a five-hour plane ride versus going to India, which will, you know, be a day in transport. And um, I went a couple times while I was still working and met a host of people and I've been working there ever since. And if you'd asked me back then, I thought I was always going to end up working in Asia because I had done a lot of like travel in Asia. Um, but anyway, it just fell into place. I think as far as the fair trade thing is, is that I just, when I first started my business, it was pre-fair trade federation. Fair trade wasn't even a word people used, but I think I've always lived by the golden rule. And I think a lot of fair trade, the principles of fair trade sort of mirror the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's like pay people fairly, treat people with respect, you know, don't be a jerk. And so um, when, uh, so there you go, that's how it sort of happened. So tell me how you actually found the artisan groups that you're working with right now. Well, I mean, that's also a happy accident. When I first went to Guatemala, 
Um, I was young and stupid. I didn't realize the country was in the midst of civil war. Um, things were a little better than they had been. So some of the expats that had left had come back a couple of years before I went. Um, and there were certain hangouts. I found out just I and in Panahachel. And so I just started meeting the small expat population that was there. And then from there, I, um, I met some people that knew people doing artwork or I actually hired a driver. I'd done a lot of homework and knew which communities were famous for weaving and, and had him take me to places. So I just was an explorer and um, some things worked out and some things didn't. When I first went, I thought I was gonna be primarily working in home decor. So when I first started, I was looking at weaving and I was doing pillows and there's been a whole, you know, nothing's a straight line. But I mean, I have stories that I've never shared with my mother. I went to Guatemala and the driver said he had a friend who was a school teacher in a village. And we should go talk to her because she, her, the parents of her students were weavers. And we went to that village and I was asking them, how long does it take to make a, a placemat? And, you know, how much do you think it costs to make it? And can we do designs together? And when I came back 10 days later, I was told that this was Guerrilla territory. They didn't want people messing with the Indians there. And if I came back, I wouldn't go back. So um, there are definitely some learning lessons along the way. And that That's the school teacher got fired just for introducing me. So I know so, you work a lot with uh, beaters uh, at your jewelry. You have uh, beading and you also have fused glass like I'm wearing today. Okay, so, well, okay, well, so there's a, you know, there are, there are the store. Okay. So, um, okay. So when I first started my business and we're talking about 1989, I was doing a lot of, uh, home decor and, um, I was making, I was making, not, I wasn't making, but I was orchestrating the production of a lot of pillows and I, um, and you know, I found people to do work and it was beautiful twice. And then all of a sudden the indigenous people were getting drunk and the stuff wasn't made nicely. And it was a whole learning lesson. But while this was going on, I met two expat women that did beadwork themselves and they first trained women in Guatemala, Mayan women, how to do beadwork. And we collaborated together and we were the very first to bring bead. Beading is not indigenous to Guatemala. I mean, there's been beading done in Mexico for many years, but not in Guatemala. And it was these two women, a German woman and an American woman that I collaborated with, with Mayan women. We were the first to bring bead, beading to the USA from Guatemala. And now there's a huge industry of bead work. And how long, if, uh, how about the, the fused glass? The fused glass is something I started in 2011, so it's much more recent. The beading, we, I was involved in the early 90s. In fact, I'm going back a little bit, but at some point, the home decor was a struggle, and when I introduced the beadwork, I was the first. It was loved immediately. So I redefined my business, and then I became a jeweler, uh, jewelry company. It just happened that way. You know, it wasn't like I went in. Nothing's a straight line. Sometimes you just do what works. Um, the glass, I met a woman artist uh, doing some garish glass work and I, I, you know, we talked about it and I said, I think there's real potential here if we can get rid of the Chinese findings that you're using from Guatemala City and we pare down some of what you're doing and simplify it, I think we can um, create a market. So and honestly, I seeked her out. It was out of need because over the years, a lot of people jumped on my coattails for the beadwork. And a lot of copying and with, without, not, without necessarily the same uh, ethical 
processes behind it. Yeah, and it happens within our community too, I'll tell you. It's unfortunate. Um, so you talked about the collaboration process. Talk a little bit, tell me a little bit about how you, your, your design process. Because unlike me, you actually have some education and training in design, whereas I came into it with none whatsoever. But you've got good taste. I, yeah, well, of course. A lot of, I, mean, I think if you have a pulse on the U.S. market and what people like to uh, wear, wear, and you know what you like to wear, you probably can help your artisans um, make good choices for things that you can ultimately sell here. Um, I don't know, it's kind of funny. Like, I think I, I have a real knack for working in colors, and my lines are all driven by color. Um, I do watch a lot of what designers do with the New York and Paris runway shows. I look for color. I try and find trends in magazines or shapes that might be interesting. And um, yeah, I draw little pictures or I see something extraordinary made in silver and I think, wow, how could that be done with beadwork and draw little pictures and I sit in the workshop with my colleagues in Guatemala and we try and come up with things. Uh, it's really interesting. Early on when I started, um, typically the people in Guatemala like very bright things and very garish color combinations. And I remember there was a phase early on in the early 90s where I said, I only wanted to do beadwork and solid colors. So I only wanted bracelets and necklaces. They were, we were only gonna use one color of bead. It was going to be cream or one color navy or one color brown. And then everybody was laughing at me like, this is so boring. This is so uninteresting. But you know what? People up here in the U.S. ate it up because it was sophisticated. And um, so I have, go sometimes ahead. I think I just have some you know, good hunches. So do you have any favorite design magazines or fashion magazines that you uh, keep on your table to browse when you're thinking about new designs? Am I supposed to answer that honestly? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think the thing is, for years, I subscribed to every magazine you can think of, and I flipped through them all. I mean, InStyle, Vogue, Marie Claire, I mean, on and on and on. But you know what? They've all lapsed. <laughs> that that happens. Magazines have lapsed. And, and um, I, I, I think also, um, you know, the world has changed a lot. 15 years ago, I would design big, big necklaces and big, big bracelets, things that wholesale for quite a bit of money, and the stores would eat them up. And I exhibited at the accessory show in New York. And to survive over time, what I have found is that my smaller items, the simpler it is, the smaller it is, the more price competitive it is, the more gifty it is. It's almost like my line has become more gifty. We'll call it fashion, but it really is more gifty than high-end fashion. And so really those kinds of magazines don't provide the inspiration for smaller, cuter. Yeah. So um, when, when I dove in and founded Hunards back in now 2014, we're, we're approaching, well, we're past five years, past the fifth year anniversary. I thought I knew what I was doing. Uh, and the more time that goes by, the more I realize I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> and gradually I'm learning things um, but there were some, some major, oh my God, I wish I'd known that before I started. I always call the first five years of my business tuition. Well, that's sort of the way I've taken on thinking about it. Yeah. The first five years were tuition. I made, trust me, I made lots of mistakes or I went in and just bought gobs of stuff from people that I had no idea what I was doing. And you know what? I still, and I'm very bad at giving things away. So I still have gobs of like stuff from once upon a time that. 
Have I ever told you about my first shopping trip? It, was, it wasn't actually a trip. I shopped on Facebook. Uh, I needed to get some, once I decided I'm gonna do this because there was nobody else working in Tajikistan. Oh, our internet connection is unstable. Oh, maybe it'll come back. There it is. Uh, I had my contact go to the biggest craft fair of the year in Tajikistan and take pictures. Uh, he knew all the master artisans and he just went around taking pictures. And he sent them to me and I would say, oh, what's that? How much does that cost? How long does it take to make? Okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> so much. Uh, so I did that with my entire first order and just <laughs> got some really interesting things once they arrived. <laughs> so that, um, so even somebody with, with design experience and color and fashion sense, you still made a lot of mistakes at the beginning. Yeah, you know, and the other thing that has happened, you know, I've until just recently, recently I've started to retail a bit, but until really two years ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago, I was exclusively wholesale. And so a lot of times you, I would work with my artisans, but I never even knew what my cost was going to be until the samples were made. And then sometimes I would get the samples and go, oh my God, you know, I can't wholesale this. There's not enough room. The perceived value isn't there. So, you know, sometimes you think you're doing things right, but hi. Yeah, it can be a real challenge. So, or, and then, so, yeah, so that, that also is part of the process. So, what's your, been your biggest satisfaction over the years? My biggest satisfaction? What do you feel best about? What do you feel most fulfilled by? What's, I, you know, what's I make it worthwhile? I love designing things and seeing them finished and then having customers love it and being successful selling it and i love working with my customers i love working with people that gives me great pleasure and then of course i love being able to pay my bills and knowing that i did all this work and i can take care of myself um because i, I take care of the artists first i pay the trade show second and in the end i have to be able to take care of me um, so going back to membership in the Fair Trade Federation, when I joined five years ago, it was a very elaborate process and it was a scary process for me and it took an, a year to get through the process and finally get accepted. But you were, you joined much earlier. So t how, how was it when you... Okay, I probably didn't join much much earlier than you it's interesting because I think I told you earlier that you know I've always lived by the golden rule I think I've always lived my life and worked by all the principles set out by the Fair Trade Federation except that when I uh, I had some other colleagues at the trade shows approach me I think it was 93 or 94 that's when Fair Trade Federation uh, began and they uh, reached out to me to be a founding member of Fair Trade Federation. And there was a pre preliminary rules about membership. It was like, we, we can come in and audit your books. And I had come from corporate America and I was like, but you're not the IRS. I'm not giving you, you know, permission to come audit my books. So I, and at the time I knew I lived by the golden rule and I, you know, just said, no, I don't think this is right for me right now. And I, years went by and, you know, I knew I was always an ethical business person. And, and the truth is nobody knew what fair trade was and nobody used those words. And 
I had plenty of business. So I wasn't overly concerned with that. And then over, and I think what it's really interesting, I'm jumping around here, but with my jewelry, for a long time, people bought my jewelry because it was beautiful. And then there was a time, then people started um, uh, learning about fair trade. I'm not, uh, this is already, I think in, I wanna say 2000, you know, early 2000s. And uh, or later, mid, you know, 2007-ish, you know, and uh, then it became a buzzword. So then what happened was people were, then there were some people buying my line because it was fair trade, but it wasn't until much later. People always bought my line just because they thought it was pretty. And then, um, so, it, so at some point, this whole thing with fair trade as people were getting educated, it turned out it became a buzzword. And a lot of people were using it, you know, cavalierly, oh, I'm fair trade, I'm ethical, when frankly, I knew some of these people very well, and I knew some of these people saying it were not. And so that is when I decided it was time to go through the screening process and put my money where my mouth was and become part of this organization. So I did not join right in the beginning. It happened, I'd have to look it up, but you know, I, I don't even know when I joined, maybe it's 10, 12 years ago. 13 years ago. So, um, and you asked me about the process. I think the process for me may have been more simple for you because when I joined initially, I only worked with two groups. You know, some of our colleagues work with many, many, many groups. So there's like a lot more screening that has to take place. Yes. So, when when um, I started, I had many not not a huge number but I had multiple groups because I didn't know what would sell right right because right. I was the only company I'm still the only company in the US that imports handicrafts from Tajikistan so I was trying everything to see what would work and it, it was complicated trying to to assess multiple groups and get information from the artisans and it, it felt, for me at the time, it felt somewhat overwhelming because I was also trying to build the airplane while flying it, <laughs> uh, put, building my own website. Uh, you're a solopreneur. You understand uh, the, the challenges of doing everything yourself. Everything, We're, we do the work of four. <laughs> so, so what's that experience like? I know it's, um, for me it can be, I love being able to make all my own decisions. I don't have to ask anybody's opinion about anything. And if I wanna do something, I can just do it. But at the same time, I have, a never ending to do list, and I agonize probably more than I should about what should I do first <laughs> of the 43 things on my list. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, uh, yeah, right. We have lists. I have lots of lists here. Um, yeah, I just keep a list to keep me organized, and I'm a real gunner. Boom, 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 boom. I, you know, I guess that's not been, my issue's been more, I, when I was younger, I used to be very social. And now being a solepreneur, as you call it, um, I've gotten very good at being by myself. And with a lot of times it's lonely. In the early first meant well, for several years in the earlier 2000s, I had an employee. Um, but I think it was right around the crash, it was 2000, 2008. Mm -hmm. I had an employee that I let go for cause and things had gotten so tough, I just didn't replace her. And I've been, you know, killing it on my own ever since. So I think more from, you know, 
sometimes it's just hard. It's a little lonely, but. So do you, do you think being a woman business owner has, has had a major impact in any way as you've built your business over the years? What do you mean? Do I think it's helped me or hindered me? I, helped, hindered, impacted you in any way? No, I, I don't, I don't view me, myself as being helped or hindered by the fact that I'm a female, especially in this industry where there are so many females. Uh, I mean, mo most of the artisans are female, but even when you go to our trade shows, I think there's a lot of female owned businesses um, in the gift industry and in fair trade and, and jewelry making, especially jewelry, it's mostly women. So, yeah. It, and it, it makes sense. Our customers are, are women, our business colleagues are women. Um, I mean, in corporate America, I think it's a whole, you know, another thing, you know, but in terms of compensation in the workplace and all that. But I think uh, in our industry, uh, I, 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 I don't feel like I'm in worse shape because I'm a girl. <laughs> Why, do you? Um, I think probably the only area where I perhaps feel at a disadvantage uh, and plot and part of it is having come to this world so late in my life I spent 30 years practicing law so have I never had any experience in marketing or sales and I think men are just socialized uh, earlier and more at the, the socialization process is more attuned to selling and selling yourself and women are uh, socialized to be more humble and more self-deprecating and uh, not as uh, I don't forward. I, I, I I've never felt like I was disadvantaged because I was a woman in the trade show booth. I think when you're showing people something you love and you're excited about it, it's really easy to show it. And even though I'm by myself all the time working here, I do, do come from a background of having been a social animal. So I'm with people in the past. I remember I have a colleague, a friend who's a fair trade, well, He's not Fair Trade Federation, but one would assume he's an ethical business out of Guatemala. And we were neighbors very early on at the show, and we hadn't met yet. And then we met. At first, when he, I found out his booth was going to be near me, I said to him, do you think this is going to be a problem? That, do you think that they put us right next to each other because we might be competitors? And it turned out we weren't competitors, but what was so funny after that, he used to come over to my trade show booth and watch me with my customers and he'd go oh my god nancy she like will like call at the time okay i'm a 60 year old woman now but at the time i was a 30 year old woman and he would say nancy would speak to 60 year old women and call them girls and they'd giggle and they'd be so happy and they'd walk away from her booth with an order and i like he a man would be like i would never have the gift to chit chat with the women like she does, so I don't know. Your personality, I think, influences it a lot. Whether it whether it is a is a hindrance or a, a help <laughs> to be a woman. Yeah, I I love working with my customers, and you know, ninety eight percent of the time they like working with me, and two percent of the time I have had cases where people did not get my sense of humor and I upset people. It definitely has happened. It's not very often, but. I get it. Shifting gear is a question that is at the top of everybody's mind these days, or at least the whole thing, COVID-19. 
and the new world we're all living in where we do all our communication on Zoom or the phone or texting, email. How has that impacted Dunnett's and Company? Uh, how, how have you been able to pivot or have you? Well, I think for people in the business we're in, this has been an extraordinarily tough time. I, for most of my career, have been exclusively wholesale. And there was a time when my customers said, you retail. And if I did, they wouldn't buy from me. And my business was strong enough that I didn't attempt to do any retail. Other people started doing retail 10 years ago and are way ahead of the game because they now have built a retail presence. So now that most of the stores are closed or opening just a little bit, um, what, I was, what I was saying is, that for many years, I've been exclusively a wholesaler. And there was a time, maybe eight, 10 years ago, when people were starting to sell online and my customers would say, do you sell online? And if I did, they wouldn't buy from me. And at the time, my wholesale business was strong enough that I didn't even think to start building a retail business. Now, the people that started 10 years ago doing re retail, that didn't worry about those customers not buying from them have already built up a retail presence. Um, I just started doing a little retail starting about two years ago. And so it's very slow going. And in the meantime, as you know, all the stores are closed and all my wholesale show orders from earlier in the year are sitting in my floor and I'm over there, I'm pointing over to the other side of the office you know, waiting for a customer here or there to accept an order. So it's all about cash flow now. I know many of us have gotten some PPP uh, payroll protection money. Most of us, if you're a solopreneur, you don't, you don't qualify for unemployment. Um, some of us are getting loans from the Small Business Administration uh, to try and tide us over. But the future, it's rather uncertain now because there are going to be no more trade shows this year. The few retail events I had lined up have also been canceled. And so slowly, I'm trying to build a little bit of online retail, but without having, um, you know, a built-in customer base, it, it's very challenging. I mean, I think our colleagues who own retail stores are faring better with trying to retail online because they already have a following. They have a customer base. Yeah. So these are very challenging times. I think... Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably covering my nut. My, I, I, I live lean and I have very low overhead. I mean, in the scheme of things, I, I have an office out of my home, but I live lean, so. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, <coughs> I'm doing the same thing with Hunards, working to build that online process, that online visibility. Uh, and it's tough to do when there are, Seven billion people online right now. <laughs> the uh, there's a lot of competition, and unfortunately, um, I do have a small presence on Amazon Handmade. I don't advertise anymore because when I tried it, there was nothing left for me. You know, so you know, Amazon's fees and advertising. There wasn't much profit margin left over, so I stopped. So it is, it is tough, you know, there's these bigger powerful uh, venues like Amazon or eBay or Etsy um, where you do have to advertise to get seen, uh, but they have a built-in customer base. Whereas, you know, trying to drive traffic to our own websites is definitely more challenging. And I think I told you the other thing I'm, you know, I, you know, I, I shoot from the hip a lot, trying to come up with things that might work. And I think that's why I mentioned to you that um, next month, I mean, I have food in my refrigerator, right? I'm thankful. I'm not making much money now, but I'm not worried where my next meal is coming from. And we all know that there are a lot of people a lot worse off than us. And so Absolutely. I kept thinking, gee, you know, how can I maybe help others? I don't have a bunch of money just to give. So next month, I'm going to try and um, promote my website. 40% of what I sell will go to the Los Angeles Food Bank. So, you know, that way I'll cover my expenses and I'll maybe be able to give a nice gift to them. I hope, I hope. It's just something I'm trying. We'll see. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot on uh, Facebook pages and things, uh, various 
efforts that members of the Fair Trade Federation are, are trying to support the larger community. Sometimes it's fundraising for their artisans. Sometimes it's placing orders that have to sit overseas for an indefinite, indefinite period of, I've got some of those. Uh, sitting in Tajikistan because the airports are closed and there's no yeah. uh, projected opening date even for cargo planes out of Central Asia right now. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I love about being a member of the Fair Trade Federation is, is because the people in the FTF really have a, a larger sense of community. Uh, it may look different for each member, but you don't get into this business to become a millionaire. <laughs> no, we would have been importing junk from China. Yes, yes. Which brings me to my last question. If you were advising somebody, I mean, forget the, forget the pandemic. Assume that we get through it and we're sort of somewhere about where we were before the world shut down. And somebody said, oh, I've always wanted to do what you're doing, Nancy. What do you think? What would you say? Uh, well, it would depend on what really inspires them. If they wanted to get into it because they thought they're going to make a really good living and like be able to afford a fancy car, I'd say, don't do it. But um, I think the way of the future, but it's very, very, very tough, is 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 um, re online retail. But. You know, it's kind, kind of, of like a noise. 80, 80, 20% uh, of the people have 80% of this, 80 percent of the success. So, gosh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. What were you going to say? Yeah, the 80-20 rule, unfortunately, seems to, to rule in many aspects of life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, I don't know, when I see a young person, and there's not many, when I say young, I mean someone under 30, 30 and younger, who I've met this year, over the last couple of years, start a small business um, selling imported, fair trade, ethically made goods. I'm always surprised, because I think I see more people um, leaving now than entering. Um, I don't know if it's because they're aging out or because they're just not making, you know, cutting it and making, you know, making their way financially. But um, I, I think, I, I think my advice would be, now I'm just thinking as we talk, is that uh, you have to be very strategic. I mean, before you jump in, really go see what's on the market because the only way to succeed is if you have something or you're doing something that's totally unique. There's 85 million people selling jewelry. There's, I'm exaggerating here, 85 million people selling scarves. You know, I think in six months there'll be no more market for masks because everybody <laughs> and their sister is selling masks. But I'm just, you know. Yeah, and what I, I think the thing I, that if you're I lucky enough to stumble upon something. And I think the gift market is more where it is than the high-end fashion market. I think the way people are moving towards sustainability, I think people are going to want to own less. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that I would add uh, to what you said is be prepared to learn to use technology. Uh, oh, my goodness. And but the young kids are already doing that, which which is which is great. They they can they can uh, dance circles around us old folks <laughs> on the technology side. And I have consistently hired when I've hired technology advisors and consultants. They've always been younger than me. Uh, and I have to tell you, 
I, I hired my first social media consultant. It's probably been now three years ago. And at our first meeting, we sat at my dining room table and she helped me open an Instagram account. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now, now you're a star on Instagram. Yeah, I have, I have thousands of followers, although many of them are physically resident in Central Asia. <laughs> but you're very good about posting. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer, but I really appreciate you. I, you said before we got started that you're not actually zoomed out that this is sort of a new medium for you. So you're, you're, um, this was not something you would normally have thought about doing. So I appreciate you jumping in and- I'm a little nervous to watch me do that. It'll be fine. <laughs> so, oh, so before we leave, if anybody listening to this wants to get in touch with you or see your products, where should they go? Well, okay. Well, I don't, my, you can see on the screen, my name is Nancy Dominitz, so shop.com, and uh, you'll find all my social media accounts and my email and everything there. Uh, could you spell it out again? There was a, a buffering on the, on the internet. Yes, well, my last name is Dunitz, D-U-N-I-T-Z, and my retail site is Shop Dunitz, S-H-O-P-D-U-N-I-T-Z.com. That's because when I first started my business, if I called myself Pillows Plus, I would have been in big trouble. So I just <laughs> used my name. Well, thanks again, and I'm sure we'll be on the phone or, or Zoom or something uh, in soon. So thanks again for doing this and I'll say goodbye. Okay. We can try again another time. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ricky.